is a savage age of sorcery and bloodshed, where strong men and beautiful women, warlords, priests, magicians, and gladiators battle to carve a bloody path leading to the throne of Lemuria. It is an age of heroic legends and valiant sagas, too. And this is one of them. You fell in with his band of cutthroats in the city of Malakut, his claims of wealth beyond measure and adventure beyond imagining beating an endless rhythm within your savage souls. At first it was everything promised, the excitement of riding your crork out of the rising sun, the howl of battle in your parched throat, and the grim yet glorious reaping that followed as fatalistic caravan guards took up sword to protect sobbing fat merchants cowering under their wagons. Hi, so you've come back for another action-packed review. Barbarians of Lemuria. Barbarians of Lemuria is a sword and sorcery role-playing game. Sword and sorcery is a subgenre of fantasy. It's full of swashbuckling heroes engaged in exciting and violent conflicts. Uh, good is good, evil is evil, there's romance, element of magic, supernatural. Unlike other types of fantasy, the stakes tend to be more personal, and the moment of telling is where the action is. I personally always enjoyed this genre, because I like the relatively short stories, and they don't mess around with a lot of fluff, or filler paragraphs and chapters. I love going to used bookstores and looking for the thinnest little books on the shelf. Uh, of course, the most famous character of sword and sorcery is Conan the Barbarian. Myself, I've always been a fan of the lesser barbarians, uh, like... Brack and Kothar, and Claw from the old DC comic books, and of course, Thongar of Lemuria. What? You don't know who Thongar of Lemuria is? While Conan is the most famous sword and sorcery character, there are many others, including Thongar of Lemuria. And since this game is called Barbarians of Lemuria, not Barbarians of Hyperborea, you can pretty much guess where the inspiration for it lies. These rules could easily be used to run any sword and sorcery game, but the setting is much more inspired and focused on Lynn Carter's awesome Thongar books. If, like me, you defined awesome as, you know, thin little action-packed, fun, campy books. Uh, Lemuria in the game is set in the far future, but it's a pseudo-prehistoric continent. You're placed in our old world. Uh, it's a mixture of civilization and barbarism. It's still the most advanced continent in the world, and it has a slightly, just a slight science fiction-y feeling with its magic-based technology. Uh, it includes city-states, airships, and unique invented flora and fauna, uh, such as people riding around on ostrich-like birds and giant lizards, and there are no horses there. Uh, many people define the Thongor books as Conan written by Burroughs. So this is what Barbaria, Barbarians of Lemuria sets out to emulate, and it does it really well. The core die mechanic revolves around rolling two six-sided dice, adding the relevant attribute, and the combat, if fighting, a relevant career when not fighting. Sometimes the GM adds an extra modifier to the harder tasks. These are a small single digit numbers and pretty easy to remember. The target number is always a nine. Rolling two sixes is always a success and possibly a mighty or legendary success. And rolling snake eyes is always a failure and can be a really bad failure. There are other times when you only roll a single six sided die such as for damage and initiative. The different type of die rolls give the game a cool old school vibe, which is perfect for the sword and sorcery genre, but a strong and versatile core mechanic gives it a modern sensibility. Looking at a character such as Honga the Mighty gives a good understanding of the game. The background story tells where Krongar has been and his experiences. Attributes, combat, and careers are usually in the 0-5 to five zone. Attributes rate a character's natural aptitudes, Combat rakes is fighting and defending abilities, and careers are broad, narrative-driven areas of skill. Careers are usually directly drawn from the character's background story. Lifeblood is how much damage Krongar can take before dying or being unconscious, and hero points are that extra bit of luck that allows you, or your gods, to change your fate. Protection is your armor. This is subtracted from the damage caused by weapons, and weapons are obviously the thing that caused damage. Although in Krongar's hand, pretty much anything could be a weapon. Boons and flaws are granted when you choose your character's birthplace when creating the character. They are things that you're particularly good or poor at, and usually mean you get to roll an extra die 
and take the two highest for boons and take the two lowest for flaws. Careers are one of Barbarian Lemuria's unique claims to fame. There are 26 of them in the book and you can make up as many as you, you like as you go. Each character chooses four careers at the start, which are sort of a career path when they write their character's background, and these define the character's skills. For example, someone who was or is a thief is expected to be skilled in anything that a thief would be expected to be able to do, like picking pockets, backstabbing, sneaking around. As long as the player can explain why they should be able to do something, and the GM agrees, you can use the career rank as your bonus. Combat is very traditional, which is appropriate for a hack and slay genre such as this. After rolling for initiative, you roll 2d6 plus agility plus the appropriate combat ability, trying to get a 9 plus the defense of your opponent. The opponent may choose to dodge or parry instead of attacking back. If you hit, then you roll for the weapon's damage plus your strength or half your strength for a ranged weapon. The opponent rolls or takes the default for any protection that he happens to be wearing. This is subtracted from the damage. Damage is then applied to lifeblood. At 0, you're unconscious, and at negative 5, you're dead. The game also has easy rules for fighting lots of mooks, or rabble as they're called in this game, which allows your hero to mow through groups of less tanned and muscular bound opponents, just like in the sword and sorcery books. You can spice up combat by spending hero points to turn successes into mighty or legendary successes, to shake off wounds, or even defy death. Barbarians of Lemuria has a unique and awesome freeform-esque magic system. While good sorcerers and magicians are few and far in between sword and sorcery, it will be hard to resist the temptation to play one. There are four magnitudes of spells, cantrips, and the first two third magnitudes. Cantrips are just common little tricks that, you know, like making coins disappear and stuff like that. First magnitude are utility spells and simulate things that pretty much other characters could do without magic if they wanted to. Second magnitude are grand displays like toppling walls or buildings or turning an army into forest trees, and third magnitude are those horrible, horrendous things that only power-hungry and insane sorcerers might attempt, like bringing back ancient gods. Spells require the expenditure of arcane power and a casting roll. But where it gets cool is the list of casting requirements the sorcerer can implement to make casting the spell easier. Now you know why that insane sorceress who is trying to summon the death god casts her spells but naked when the stars of Zulgar lied on that haunted mountain of Zoon while slitting her own wrists. Crazy. So what are the things you might like about Barbarians of Lemuria? First off, the rules are simple to learn and to use. It's easy to create characters. If you like the sword and sorcery genre, the basic core mechanics of this game really simulate that well, but it really shines with a lot of the more subtle rules like the MOOC rules and spending hero points and the uh, narrative career system which really emulates the abilities of the heroes in the sword and sorcery genre and all the barbarians and such. The magic system also is, is really neat because it simulates that bizarre supernatural evil essence of the sword and sorcery genre and not only that but it's, you know, it's really fun to use and unique for players of a lot of fantasy role playing games. Um, finally, you know, the setting itself is pretty neat. The one presented in the book is good. There are a lot of plot hooks. There, it, it's concise enough that you can learn it easily enough and not feel overwhelmed, but there are a lot of different directions you can go and a lot of stuff you can do with it. So, of course, we have to follow up all the cool things in the rules with things that you might possibly not like. And to be honest, other than personal preferences, I don't think there's a whole lot of stuff not to like about this game if you like the sword and sorcery genre. Um, it's Definitely rules medium, but even at that level, some people might find it a little bit light for their tastes and lacking in a few little specific rules. Some GMs and players might have problems with, you know, guidelines for using careers and magic, especially the, the, the narrative aspects of that, because this game requires a little more player participation than a lot of role-playing games where you just say, okay, I'm going to do this. In this game, you kind of have to describe what you're going to do and how you're going to do it to make it, you know, exciting and action-packed for everyone. Um, I have a few personal nitpicks that are, are minor and probably won't bug most people. Uh, the game has a few roles where you use a D2 and a few roles where you do use D3. So it might be D3 minus 1. You know, I just like rolling regular dice and I'm not big on subtraction either when you have a possibility of, you know, Things going below one. Of course, they all count as one. Uh, the map in the back is a nice map, but I would have liked to see in that 
black and white outline map like you see at the beginning of you know the sword and sorcery books you read and finally i i really like the artwork through it which i showed you a bunch of examples on this review it's by a guy and i apologize if i mispronounce it i believe his name is john grump and he does about 95 percent of the art in the book but there's like three or four pictures that aren't by him and it's such a jarring difference that it's just like ugh. so in my personal opinion i would have used the same artist through the entire thing but those are all minor nitpicks, and other than that, great game. Obviously, I like this game, or I wouldn't have taken the time to share this review with you. There are a lot of role-playing games out there, especially fantasy ones, but it's really something special when a setting and a system and a genre just mesh so well. I'd give it two big thumbs up, but I cut them off casting my third magnitude spell. But if you really love the sword and sorcery genre, this game is definitely a great tool to do it with. I wonder what Grubman of Lemuria would think of this game. Grubman, what is best in life? A nice coffee, vanilla, not that hazelnut on that crap, and playing barbarians of Lemuria. Ah, ah, ah. Wait, where's the queen? I don't know what you did with the queen. Did you bring her down? She's, 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 she's over my shoulder. <laughs> she's over my shoulder. She's over my shoulder the whole time. You grab her wherever she was, throw her over your shoulder. Run for it! <laughs>